Uh, without further ado, uh, uh, call uh, now the next panel uh, speakers to please turn their videos on. As I, we are going to do now is the presentation of the next panel that is going to start and it includes two streams. Uh, good, welcome, Frederic Calado. Welcome, Lars Montelius, uh, Paulo Gonçalves, and Astrid Vicenza. Welcome so much. So you, you are going to be a part of uh, the next panel stream that we are going to start uh, transmitting live. So Frederico Calado, all yours. Thank you so much, Paulo. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, stream A. Um, I hope uh, if you're interested in stream A that uh, you uh, will continue with us. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, part of this very important event. Uh, it's an honor really to be also representing Novartis. Uh, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm the head of innovation and partnerships in our Center of Excellence for Real World Evidence in Novartis Oncology. I'm Portuguese, as you can probably see from my, my name, uh, but I've been, I've been with the company for nine years, uh, seven of which in um, headquarters here in Basel, Switzerland. Um, I think we have a very interesting session today, um, quickly introducing Ashit Vicente, who will be talking about precision um, uh, healthcare and uh, One Million Genomes Initiative, which I know a little bit about, so I'm, I'm very interested to learn about her perspective about this as well. Then uh, followed by Lars Montelius, who is, uh, I think, based on the slides that he shared previously with uh, the other speakers, going to give us a very interesting uh, perspective on the ownership of data applied to the scenario of a continuous generation of data, less uh, from the perspective of the um, treatment, but more from a perspective of uh, pro prophylactic uh, intervention. So I am very eager to, to hear his thoughts about that. And then finishing with, um, with, uh, with Paulo Gonçalves from SPAM, who will be um, you know, challenging us to think about treating the patient as a real a customer. And I think he's going to draw on a couple of parallel um, scenarios with other industries outside of healthcare. Um, so very interesting, all very interesting topics for me. As for me, I'll be using a couple of minutes to uh, describe my thoughts on, actually, I think COVID will be a very inter interesting driver and an opportunity to uh, solve the number one hurdle to value-based healthcare. Uh, Value-based healthcare for me is a very interesting theoretical construct, but has been having some practical uh, issues in, in terms of its implementation. But I think COVID will help us with that um, in solving the, the problem with the lack of flow of health data. Um, so that's going to be my, my own presentation. So uh, without uh, further ado, I, I would like to uh, give the stage to uh, Astrid, who will be speaking uh, about the um, One Million Genomes, uh, Genomes Initiative. Thank you so much, Rick. Just a point. We are now one, more than 1,000 live visualizations on Facebook. This is not to make you nervous, but uh, <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay, good morning. Um, so uh, this is a lot of responsibility now. I first want to thank uh, Hospital do Futuro and I want to thank Paulo for this invitation. It's um, really nice to be here and to be part of this uh, endeavor that I was not aware of uh, previously. So uh, Paulo had asked me to talk a little bit about personalized medicine. I call it personalized medicine, which is the term that is actually used by the European Commission and the European Union. Uh, so we can go on long debates about precision medicine and personalized medicine, but we'll stick to this at this point. And maybe Paulo, you can share my presentation now. Um, so, and uh, because we were talking, I see everyone is talking about data, then I'll um, talk a little bit about an initiative, a European initiative from the member states supported by the European Commission that I think will be very important uh, for healthcare and certainly health research. Text. My first slide is really uh, to provide a, provide a constant, um, context uh, regarding variability of the human population. So we're all different. And actually, this session is also about patient adherence to medication. And that has sometimes a lot to do with whether it is actually resulting and providing a solution or not. Um, so we're all different. And frequently, um, what happens is that uh, 
uh, a particular treatment uh, does not have the effect that it was expected. It may frequently, this happens in cancer, but in many other uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, disease or in many other diseases. And so um, it may not have an effect or actually it may cause adverse drug reactions. And this is because the traditional treatment or the traditional approach was to treat the disease and not to treat the patient. Uh, so can I, I'm not sure if I, The next one? Next one, yes. And I, so actually to talk about variability, I'll just quote uh, Sir William Hosler who said, uh, and it's very pertinent nowadays, that variability is the law of life, law of life and has no two faces are the same, so no two bodies are alike, and no two individuals react alike and behave alike under the abnormal conditions, which we know as disease. So if you can uh, skip to the next slide. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have access to, but I imagine not. Okay, so um, our traditional approach to treatment was to treat uh, the disease and not the patient. But what happened is that in a group of patients, we have a lot of variability as expected. It's uh, very much determined genetically in the context of an environment. So it's not just genetics, it's a lot of other things. But what happened, what would happen is that the therapy would be you know, effective in, for some of the patients, for the majority in general, because once a drug is released actually uh, into the market, um, it has been widely tested, but there are always a group of patients for which it does not result and a group of patients that actually show adverse um, drug reactions. And what personalized medicine wants to do or precision medicine wants to do is actually treat the patients according to their individuality or their um, genetic background or their environmental uh, factors. So when you... To, to actually do this, you need to test biomarkers, uh, and that can be uh, DNA, or it can be uh, biochemical markers, or it can be imaging markers, and then you can stratify the patients according to their individual profiles. And you can actually apply the drug therapy that is more adequate to them, so that is personalized to them. And there you can improve much better. Uh, the, you can actually have big improvements in terms of the effects and the outcomes of the patient. So you can squeeze, uh, uh, move. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's complicated. Now, for a number of uh, drugs, there are already very good biomarkers. So you can actually uh, stratify the patients according to these biomarkers with a lot of confidence. But for many other drugs, this is not the case yet. And we have a lot of work to do. There's a bottleneck that, and we need to actually define better biomarkers. And to do that, if you can skip to the next slide, we actually need to do detailed profiling of the health of an individual. And this is, uh, includes genome sequences, but as I said uh, previously, uh, a lot of health data that is, might be related to biochemical markers or to imaging or any other, uh, anything that can actually be useful to stratify patients, how they uh, uh, react upon certain conditions, how their prognosis is, how the disease evolution is, is going. And then you can also use and should also use lifestyle information because we know things like diet or, um, uh, or exercise are very important determinants of, uh, of health and sometimes of disease and then environmental exposures. And if you actually profile all of these and there's examples already that are uh, being gathered uh, regarding the importance of having a very good individual profiling, you can actually improve health comes by uh, using personalized medicine. Now, one of the things that is really important for this is that you have your good markers and your good markers can only um, be actually properly identified if you have a dimension of population that allows you to reach conclusions. So in fact, if you want to stratify patients according to biomarkers, you really need a lot of data. So you're collecting a lot of data individually for each of the individuals, and this may actually help you both 
uh, define the better course of treatment or uh, predict uh, or estimate the risk for a certain disease. And this is very important mainly for uh, very complex, very common disorders like cardiovascular disease or uh, uh, neuropsychiatric diseases or autoimmune disease. But then when you put it all together from a lot of individuals, you can actually collect a lot of data that will help you uh, in identifying the correct biomarkers and looking at uh, what uh, each of the biomarkers is actually contributing for the risk of disease, for instance. Uh, so this is uh, where this type of uh, data sharing initiatives are so important. And Paulo, if you can get to the next slide, please. So the One Million Genomes Initiative is one of these initiatives that I wanted to um, uh, mention to you, uh, be partly because I'm, uh, you know, very much involved in this, and, and I think it's uh, really, really important. So um, in April 2018, a number of uh, member states uh, got together and signed uh, a declaration uh, that uh, committed uh, with a commitment uh, to actually deliver cross-border access to genomic databases and making uh, at least one million genomes accessible in the European Union together with health data by 2022. So this is a very ambitious goal. It's a very short time frame to do this, but I think we'll be able to do that. Uh, it started with a declaration signed by 13 countries. Portugal was one of the first countries to sign, and it's now signed by 22 signatory countries. You can see the map in green are all the signatory countries and seven countries with the observer status that we really hope will join us uh, in the future. So what we want to do is two things. So first, link access to existing uh, databases in each of the countries so that they actually the data can be shared. And then with all of that data from all of the countries regarding health and genomic information for uh, their citizens, uh, which may be citizens with a particular disease or just the general population, you can have a proper scale that uh, will allow you to have to do research and uh, have a clinical uh, impact because you will have the power uh, to, to actually, the statistical power to actually reach uh, conclusions that will be useful uh, for uh, clinical care. So you can skip the next slide. Uh, okay, so what I wanted also to mention, and I don't want to um, extend myself too much, but is that, um, so there's a lot of challenges in uh, setting up a project like this. Um, Part of the challenges are related to the infrastructure. Obviously, uh, data sharing is not easy. Um, uh, setting up an infrastructure uh, for data sharing is not an easy endeavor. Uh, genomic data have uh, particular aspects, make it uh, quite more challenging. There's an issue of quality of data and homogeneity of data because we also want to have health data and traditionally it is not very well organized and not very homogeneous. It's it's uh, even nowadays, a lot of it is already in, uh, in databases, but some of it it's not. And it depends on the impression of medical doctors, which is very valuable, but it's difficult to actually have something that is standardized uh, in that way. Uh, also knowing what clinical data or what um, um, lifestyle data should be included in such a database is, 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 uh, is, it requires some important decisions so that we don't regret that, so that we did design this properly and we don't regret not having included some, some factors and some information later. And then there are the healthy issues, so the ethical and legal and society issues all related with data sharing. And of course, now we have the GDPR and also uh, that has to be observed. And of course, uh, every national uh, legislation. So this is a very complex uh, process. But from the outset, it was very clear that there, were, there is a reluctance from each of the countries to actually put out their, uh, the health data from their citizens and the genomic data from the health citizens to be uh, processed and management at a central location. So what we're planning to do is use a federated model that is um, really um, 
uh, somewhat inspired on the, the cross-border he has um, sharing uh, service uh, that is, uh, has been in, in, the, in developed for a long time. And how this um, should work is um, shown on this uh, diagram here. Each of the countries manages and, um, and uh, processes its own data. So if you have a research or healthcare question, you can actually have a query to a hub. And what the hub has is not the data itself, but it's a data catalog. So it knows what each of the country has available to be shared. And, uh, and then if the question is uh, pertinent and it's, uh, it's, it observes the GDPR and all the uh, legal issues and the ethical issues, then each of the country can provide that data for that limited, uh, that limited amount of data uh, to the catalog and that can be uh, conveyed to whoever asked the question, question, a research or a healthcare provider. So uh, this can be, of course, very important for research, but also for healthcare. Imagine you are, you are a, a medical doctor, you have a patient, you cannot diagnose this particular disease. This is very co common for, for uh, rare diseases, for instance, it's difficult to diagnose and uh, they're rare. And so by definition, it's difficult to find um, other individuals that have the same disease and have the same phenotype and have the same genetic causes. So then he can share the phenotype, ask a question to the hub and say, is there anyone out there that has a patient with the same phenotype that has a genetic cause that has been identified so that I can actually establish the course of treatment or whatever for my patient. This also happens to cancer. So we have actually three uh, use cases which are rare diseases, cancer, and then a uh, more complex uh, issue of the, of, of the common uh, uh, multifactorial disorders like cardiovascular or psychiatric disorders. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have so, to uh, uh, these are the the now. But we're now um, thinking of uh, COVID-19 as everyone else is, and we're thinking how actually this model can be very helpful to uh, look into, to do research and look into the host susceptibility to infection. So we all know for this disease, the symptomatology is very varied. Um, uh, the outcome is very uh, variable as well. So we would like to know what are the host characteristics uh, and genomic uh, 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 characteristics that may actually have an impact on the outcome of the infection. So this is another use case uh, that might be very interesting and relevant uh, for today. Thank you so very much. What I have to share at this point, but I'll be oh, happy to answer any questions.